Hello and welcome to the Comlex Instant Podcast. Today's topic is the treatment of nephrolithiasis. How do you treat kidney stones? Well, for acute pain reduction, generally NSAIDs are beneficial as analgesia in renal colic. And a combination of NSAIDs and opioids may be more beneficial than monotherapy alone. Local warming of the abdomen and the lower back will also reduce pain and transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, the TENS unit, reduces pain that's caused by renal colic as well. Patients should be urged to maintain a urine volume of greater than 2 liters per day and some patients benefit from alpha blockers or calcium channel blockers because they facilitate the passage of urinary stones. There is research that shows that transurethral rhythotripsy appears to be slightly more effective than the extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. However, the extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy is associated with fewer complications. And what about the electrolytes and fluid? Well, based on a Cochrane review, there's not enough evidence regarding the benefits of diuretics or high volume IV oral fluids in cases where patients have acute colic. As we mentioned, it's important to keep the urine volume above 2 liters per day, so patients should drink at least 3 liters per day, any fluid except milk and oxalate rich tea in certain other cases. In addition, there has been research which shows that potassium magnesium citrate formulations appear effective as prophylaxis against recurrent calcium stones. And so, not only is maintaining proper fluid and electrolyte balance important in treating patients with nephrolithiasis, but the diet that patients receive also plays a critical role. So a review of some of the most important foods that the patient should be eating or avoiding is important in management of stroke stones. Now, NSAIDs and opioids do provide analgesia, but keep in mind that meperidine has a high number of side effects. And a combination of morphine plus ketorolac is more effective than monotherapy alone. And ketorolac actually appears to be more effective and it's better tolerated in most patients um, than meperidine based on a study that was done with 154 patients randomized to one of the three groups where one group patients received ketorolac 60 milligrams IV, the second group received meperidine 50 milligrams, and the third group received both. Based on that study, the combination was not significantly different in efficacy from ketorolac alone. So giving patients ketorolac appears to be more effective than giving patients meperidine. And the adverse effects of dizziness and somnolence that are associated with meperidine can be avoided. Now let's review the role of alpha blockers. The alpha blockers help in passage of the urinary stones and it's beneficial for patients in addition to maintaining proper hydration. So other alpha blockers and other medications that are beneficial include doxycycline. Another medication is alfuzosin, which is associated with decreased pain during the stone passage and a shorter stone passage time. However, the exact benefits of doxycycline in children is yet to be proven. And another medication called temsulosin reduces pain and increases the rate of the stone expulsion particularly for stones that are less than five millimeters based on an evidence-based review 
in the Journal of Urology. So, tamsulosin hastens the expulsion of uteral stones and tantulosin also reduces renal colic but this is beneficial mainly for patients who have stones that are less than five millimeters so patients who have stones that are greater than five millimeters can have lithotripsy and then receive tamsulosin to reduce colic and possibly help with the stone expulsion. Also, another important method of stone removal is surgery. The indications of stone removal for surgery include severe pain, an infection or an obstruction, a calculus that's actually growing, or a stone that is interfering with the patient's lifestyle and you've tried all the other options. Now percutaneous nephrostomy for kidney and upper ureter is one such option and large calculi that are fragmented first by ultrasound and then they get a electrohydraulic or a laser lithotripsers to break the stone. It's more effective for simple renal stones than branched or uteral calliculi. Also, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy is a procedure where patients have an external energy source focused on a region where the stone is located to produce a high pressure that can mainly cause a electromagnetic en energy source to help reduce the stone. The fragments must pass through the ureter and stones greater than 2.5 centimeters and branched calliculi are best treated by a combination treatment with percutaneous debulking. The contraindications for extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy are pregnancy, bleeding, dyscrasias, obstruction, and infection. The ESWL is less effective than the percutaneous nephrolithiotomy for lower pole kidney stones, but may be similar to retrograde intrarenal surgery. Based on a Cochrane review that was done, which showed that three randomized trials that compared ESWL with percutaneous nephrolithotomy in 214 patients that resulted in the results we just mentioned. So shockwave lithotripsy is definitely one option and another is transurethral lithotripsy which is more effective in eliminating stones than is shockwave lithotripsy. The procedure also shows that stone fragment active retrieval may actually reduce unplanned medical and emergency room visits compared to the spontaneous passage of the stones after lithotripsy. So actively retrieving the fragments of the stones is going to be more beneficial. Next is urethral stenting, um, and stenting before shockwave lithotripsy may actually have no benefits and may actually increase the complications. And there's also not enough evidence to support uh, stenting after a uncomplicated urethroscopy. So, the follow-up care should include a comprehensive metabolic evaluation and aggressive management of active stone formation based upon fluid management, diet, etc. In addition, keep in mind that patients should be drinking high volumes of fluid, greater than 2 to 3 liters per day, reduce soft drink consumption, 
and have a low animal protein, low salt diet, which may reduce the risk of recurrent stones in patients. Also, thiazide and allopurinol reduced a recurrence of stones in several trials and have been beneficial. That was a board review of the treatment and management of nephrolithiasis. Thank you for listening and good luck in your board preparation and in medical school.